Now, with any and all true crime content, there are two possible risks to this type of content. One is that the studio who holds these interviews could claim my video and it can be taken down or all the revenue is taken away. And two, it can also be flagged as inappropriate or potentially inappropriate content by YouTube systems. So I'm going to do my best to try to be as ad friendly as I possibly can during this. But just in case, if you would like to be able to make more true crime content like this possible, please consider following some of the links in the description below. That would include Patreon, merch, Audible, so on and so forth. All of those help out, so you kind of get to choose your pick. Also, thank you for watching the video regardless. Now, Scott Peterson was happily married with a wife who was eight months pregnant. It was coming up on the Christmas of 2002, and stuff kind of went down from there. He went out on Christmas Eve to go fishing, and when he came back, his wife was missing. Honestly, there is a ton of contradictory evidence, contradictory eyewitnesses, and so once again on this case, it was boiled down to what I can see non-verbally. If you would like to be able to hear a good synopsis of the backstory of Scott, go ahead and check out Dr. Grande's video. He covers the synopsis a little bit more thoroughly than I will. Now, the footage that I am going to be reviewing is from 2003, from April of 2003. That is several months of separation between the interview and the actual incident itself. This means that a nonverbal read is going to be less accurate than if it was more raw. I'm reaching out to studios to see if I can gain access to some of the more early footage and early interviews, but I haven't received any word back yet. If that does come out, then I may be able to do another analysis on a more reliable series of footage. Also, I have access to the initial interrogation tape that was released to the public, but it is, as with all interrogation tapes, absolutely atrocious video quality, and there's nothing that you can glean from the face, so it would all be reliant on just the broad gestures, posturing, so on and so forth, of the rest of his body language. I decided I didn't want to go through that one because it's an hour long, and that would be an extremely long video, but then also because it was just difficult to get a read on. It's not a great series of videos. However, if that's something that you would like to be able to see, let me know, and I might be able to get around to doing that. Without further ado, though, let's go ahead and watch this video and see what we can learn from Scott's nonverbal communication. Did you murder your wife? No, no. I just thought. And okay. <laughs> That took a long time, right? Right off the bat, this is with Diane Sawyer, and she asks an extremely pointed and effective question, did you murder your wife? And there's a whole stream of odd nonverbal communication that just pours out of Scott right off the bat. First, he does some pretty heavy and noticeable eye blocking. This shows up again and again and again in the interview, and it's something that needs to be made note of. And an eye block can indicate a need and a desire to separate oneself mentally or even physically from a negative stimulant. That could be a situation, that could be a threat, that could be a concept. All of it is centered around this idea of separation from that negative thing. So when he does that, that's important. He also looks down. This could be classified as a look of shame, or it could also be yet another distancing gesture or expression. A looking away from an uncomfortable situation is not uncommon. If you watched my most recent video on Olivia Jade, this was one of her tells of discomfort was she would look away from the person asking the uncomfortable question. It's not an uncommon tell. He also does a little nervous laugh. That's also kind of to be expected in this sort of situation, though it is arguably a strange reaction to giggle at this point. And this almost inappropriate mirth pops up multiple times in this interview, and I think it's important to note. But that's enough for this little tiny itty bitty amount of information here. Let's keep watching. I have absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance and, and use the word murder and yeah. I want to point out a verbal thing that he does here. He needlessly uses the word 
Absolutely. And there are statement analysts that say that this is just a needless fluff as if he were lying and trying to go a little bit above and beyond to convince us of this side of things. There's nothing non-verbally that affirms that. However, it is still an important piece of data that I'm keeping in mind as I continue throughout the read. I mean, that is a, a possibility. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night. And so I have watched hours and hours of footage of Scott during all the different interviews that I could possibly find, trying to establish a baseline. And from what I can tell, his baseline has this fairly neutral expression on it, with maybe a slight upturn of the corner of his mouth. That is how his face seems to rest regularly. So this is an important aspect of his baseline. So in this section, you can see that he is doing a pretty noticeable large smile. A less trained analyst would immediately look at that and be like, hey, that could be something like duping delight. But unfortunately, duping delight will usually last only a few seconds, if that. This is a prolonged expression, and it doesn't line up exactly with his eyes. You could see a little bit of action in his eyelids and eyebrow area that doesn't correlate with the smile itself. So it's not a full smile. It's not genuine glee. Now, duping delight is quite literally this mindset of glee because you have the power over the person you're lying to. That's where duping delight comes from. That's not here. It's not evident. He's smiling, but it's almost in response to the pain that you can see in his eyes. So when he's forcing this smile out, one, it's very prolonged, which is not a sign of a genuine emotion. Emotions change constantly, so when he's pushing this kind of smile consistently, that seems to be a forced expression. Now, if it's a forced expression, why is he doing it here and why is he doing it now? Well, to be very frank, many people will try to smile through pain that they're experiencing, especially emotional pain. It helps them cope. That's probably the case here. And early in the morning and during the day, all we can think about is the right resolutions to find her. So to speak on the level of emotional turmoil that he's undergoing right now, you could see the action in two primary areas. The action underneath his eyes where you can see it's tensing up. This is very common in emotional turmoil. You're about to cry and your eyes will show that before the actual tears come. And then you could see his quite literally stiff upper lip as he's working on muscling down the turmoil that he's feeling. These are indicators of genuine emotion, not a forced cry. Well, but as you know, increasingly in the public, suspicion has turned on you. Yes, definitely. Did you ever hit her? Did you ever injure her? No, no. My God, no. Um. So that was a very, very quick response. And there's two reasons that that could be either one. That's a very rehearsed response for him. He has told himself, I'm going to respond this way regardless. Or it's actually a genuine response. But it is also important to note that he looks down and off to the side. He does this, as I said, consistently throughout the interview. This look down to the side. There's not a one-size-fits-all explanation to this. It's very person-to-person -person based. So in this sort of situation, I can't right now say what that look down into the side is. I don't believe in the concept of directional IQs. There has been a large amount of research that has gone into disproving that specific facet of possible nonverbal communication. So I don't believe that he's trying to come up with an auditory lie or anything like that simply because there is not enough scientific research to back that theory. So during this time, I simply do not have an answer. I have to have more data. Violence towards women is unapproachable. It is the most disgusting act to me. All right, so as I said before, if you look at the corner of his mouth during this, it continually slips upward. And this could be because of duping delight. I don't think so. It would be more likely in this scenario to be a smile of contempt. It's on one side of the face, and it's in regards to something that he is saying he doesn't like, and his body language is showing something that could reflect that. So the likelihood is, if you're just weighing the odds, the likelihood is, is that he's being 
genuine in this point. He doesn't appreciate violence towards women. Um, and I know that uh, suspicion has turned to me. And it's, um... That's a pretty big lip compression and eye blocking cluster there. This means that he really doesn't like that idea that suspicion is being turned towards him. And this makes sense on both sides of the coin. Either he's innocent and he doesn't like it because it's wrong, or he's guilty and he doesn't like it because he could be caught. Regardless, he does not like the fact that people are pointing fingers at him. Even though he understands it, he emotionally does not like it. It's turned to me one because I'm her husband, and that's a natural thing. And I've heard all the statistics on all the news shows about that being, you know, someone that uh, a husband, ex-husband, a boyfriend, that is statistically one who would be responsible for her disappearance. Okay, he licks his lips here. I have heard some nonverbal analysts say that this is, once again, another thing related to duping delight. That's not true. Licking of the lips is a sign of nervousness. There are some who say that if you lick your lips, you're subconsciously like sticking your tongue out at somebody, and I feel like that's just reaching. It's just really trying to reach to make nonverbal analysis and nonverbal communication, and the reading thereof sound more like a superpower than the actual science that it is. So in this situation, when a person has a dry mouth, that could be because of maybe the fight or flight responses that happen in a human body when there is a threat. And that's when your mouth will actually grow dry. This is also just based off of nervousness as well. When you're nervous, you'll have a dry mouth and you'll lick your lips in that sort of situation as well. Chances are he's just nervous here. He's not doing duping delight or anything of those sorts. It's just nerves. And um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> Did you ever hit her? Did you no, ever injure her? No, no, never. So he says, no, 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 never. And some statement analysts say that this is once again him trying to fluff up his argument that he's saying no, 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 never, as if it's really trying to convince you. But I think he is trying to convince Diane in this point that he wouldn't. And the thing is, is that his nonverbal communication lines up with this. He's shaking his head no, and he's saying no. There's no oddities in his tone. He does do a substantial eye blocking. This has shown up again and again and again in this interview. So it's just something that I have to make note of those eye blocks because they're so prevalent and on so many seemingly random points. But it is still important to note. Um, I, was, I was answered your question because of the suspicion that it's been turned to me. And it turned to me because of the inappropriate romantic um, uh, that I had with Amber Fry. That was a cluster of shame. And you could see it by the setting of his face. The relaxed cheek muscles, the looking down, the relaxed corners of the mouth. It's all coming together to form this cluster that is shame. He's ashamed of the affair that he was having during this time. Amber Fry went public about the romance after seeing all the stories about Lacey Peterson's disappearance. I met Scott Peterson November 20th, 2002. I was introduced to him. I was told he was unmarried. Amber Fry came forward. I'm glad she did. You are? Definitely. Why? It's an appropriate thing to do. And it really shows what a person of character she is. Um, and it allows us to um, get back looking for Lacey. So he says that he's appreciative of his mistress coming forward to say that she didn't know about this, so on and so forth. The important thing that stuck out to me is that his body language largely aligned with the words he was saying. However, there were still those really prevalent eye-blocking expressions in there as well, so that was something that I had to make note of as I continued on through the read. Did you tell her that you were not married? I did. I did. Um, and then when uh, Lacey disappeared... Um, I called her and admittedly it wasn't immediately. It was a couple of days after Lacey's disappearance that I telephoned her and told her the truth. That's a pretty sizable lip compression there. 
and seeing that sort of thing after that sort of statement to see that nonverbal display right after a statement like that, it means he's biting back something further, either an emotion or more information. There's something that he's concealing around that. This isn't a sign of deception. It's just a sign that there's something more. We have to keep watching to find out what that is. The yeah. truth that I was married, that Lacey had disappeared, she didn't know about it at that point. And then she contacted the police. During that time, he does a pretty sizable and odd nod. It doesn't show up in his nonverbal repertoire anywhere else. And this is just a red flag. There's not really a specific meaning behind that from what I could tell. But it is an oddity during that time. And when people are being deceitful, a lot of the times, thanks again to the fight or flight responses that your body undergoes automatically, it feels more energized. So there can be odd movements during those times. It could also have freezes during those times because despite the popular saying of fight or flight, it's actually three. There's fight, flight, or freeze. Freeze isn't as well known, but it is still in there. So this is all still centered around the possibility of deception. If I saw all of this in a cluster like this, I would want to push harder there. I would want to ask more questions to really decipher if that was being genuine, because to me, it doesn't come across as genuine. There's too many oddities non-verbally to come across as completely and cleanly genuine. So I'd like to push there. But Fry says she first found out about Lacey from the news, not from Scott. Were you in love with her? No. So he says no, shakes his head, does a little bit of distance, and does a little bit of a distaste expression with his mouth. It's where this compressed lip expression pulled lightly to the side. It's disagreement or unhappiness or discomfort with that entire scenario. So he said no, and he distanced himself from it. So he likely means that he was not in love with her, and he knows the negative connotations behind that. Was this the first time? Are there others out there? No. There's no one else who can come forward? No. I owe a tremendous uh, apology to, to everyone. Okay, so when Diane's asking, is there anybody else? And he says, no, that's genuine. From what I can see, there's no reason for me to not believe him in that situation. And then he switches to this strained expression as if he's having to choke out these next words where he's saying, I owe a big apology to everyone. And it feels like he's just having to say that largely because I believe he doesn't feel that he is in the wrong as much as people see him as in the wrong on this. So when he's trying to force out this apology, you could see it all over his face in a very clear and prevalent expression of strain. Had you told anyone? Did you tell police? I told the police immediately. When? That was uh, the first night we were together. So the police I spent um, with the police. You told them about her? Yeah. Once again, a huge pile of odd expressions just pouring out of him. Last time that he had this odd pile of weird expressions, it was a sign of possible deceit. And sure enough, it was. So now he's doing another pile of odd expressions with looking down, lip compressions, this weird squint with one eye looking up at her expression, a whole bunch of needless facial expressions, which last time, if we're going to go by just patterns here, last time it meant that it was a lie. So seeing this, I would assume that next time, it's going to be a lie. December 24th on. That wasn't true. Sure enough. And then he also does a pretty sizable shrug at the very, very end as well. And this is insecurity. If I had seen that in that situation, that's such a massive cluster of red flags that I would want to, again, push harder, ask deeper questions and be a little bit more pointed in that area because it seems like it was a lie. And Scott Peterson called us after the interview to set the record straight. He said he never told the police about his affair with Amber Fry, but claims he did tell his wife. Did your wife find out about it? I told my wife. Ooh, big lip compression there as well. The lip compressions, as I just stated before, is the biting back of an emotion or further information. And in this area, it could be both. Maybe there was more to that story than he's sharing, or maybe there's a large amount of negative emotions behind that. 
both of those answers are completely plausible and they're not mutually exclusive. They can both be true. Regardless, there's more baggage behind that than he was allowing himself to say right there. When? In, um, early December. Did it cause a rupture in the marriage? It was not um, a positive, obviously. It's a, a, you know, inappropriate. Um, but so much eye blocking here. Just extraordinary amounts of eye blocking. It looks like he's about to fall asleep with how much eye blocking there is. This isn't great for him. This isn't a great look because it shows that all that he wants to do is detach himself from that, which I suppose I could understand. I would want to detach myself from stupid or terrible things that I've done, but it, it's just not coming across as genuine to the viewers. It's not coming across as open to the viewers or as compassionate to the viewers. It's just coming across as defensive and detached. It was not something that we weren't um, dealing with. A lot of arguing? No, no, no. Um, I, I, you know, I can't say that. That even, you know, she was okay with the idea. A lot of odd verbal stuttering during this, and during a nonverbal analysis, it's still very important to pay attention to the verbal side of things, and I try to keep it in mind. During these videos, I really try to strip it down and rely on as much of exclusively nonverbal communication as I can, but it's really not good to just ignore the other facets. So during this part where he's seemingly stuttering over his words, an abnormal amount, it's just striking me as odd in this instance, and also the words that he's saying don't make sense either. Now, it could be true that maybe it was just like a small setback in their marriage. Marriages all function differently. But with this sort of activity around it, that doesn't make as much sense. It feels more like he might be trying to hide some facet of it, especially with the earlier nonverbal communication, than what he's revealing on this interview. Chances are his wife was way more upset about it than he's trying to sell it as, but he knows that he can't say that it was a pretty big deal because that's, that's way worse for him. And he doesn't want to have people looking at him. He wants to have people, and he said this himself, I don't want people looking at me, I want them looking for Lacey, that's his wife. And I, I don't know, I don't buy that it was just a super smooth transition for them. But uh, it wasn't anything that would break us apart. There wasn't a lot of anger? No. Do you really expect people to believe that an eight-and-a-half-month pregnant woman learns her husband has had an affair and is saintly and casual about it? Accommodating? Makes a peace with it? Well, I, yeah, I, you don't know. No one knows our relationship but us. So he does a little bit of shrugging in there. He does a little bit of this nervous pulling of the corner of the mouth towards his ear. This is all a sign of nerves and insecurity and possible insincerity. His pitch increases as well. This is all a sign of strain because that can be pretty incriminating for him. Um, and that's at peace with it. Not happy about it. This is another oddity in his baseline. He's holding very, very strong eye contact with Diane during this time. And it's abnormal throughout the rest of the interview and actually the rest of the footage that I compiled of Scott. This really, really strong, heavy, relentless gaze is kind of odd. This can be a sign of deceit. It's not a guaranteed sign of deceit, but considering everything else that we just learned about him through his nonverbal communication, chances are it really is a sign of deceit. Why did you tell her? It was the right thing. Because again, you know that people sitting at home 
He said it was the right thing. He shook his head no, and the corner of his mouth was pulled down in this expression here. That doesn't lend towards his innocence in this sort of situation. It doesn't lend towards his side of the story on this. I don't feel like any of this entire area is how it actually happened. I feel like he's lying during this entire subject area. Have imagined that either you were in love with someone else, mm -hmm. therefore you decided to get rid of this entanglement, namely your wife and your child, or there was just an angry confrontation. Neither of those was the case. This is odd, because when he says this time, neither of those was the case, that seems to be true. His body language is aligned with his words. He does a blink in there, but it seems to be a normal length blink. Everything seems to be synchronized there. So this could be either one, he's telling the truth and everything else that we just saw and we're able to kind of decipher is inaccurate. Or this time, he was just able to tell a fairly convincing lie. Chances are, if we're just basing it off of probabilities alone, the larger amount is probably true, the smaller amount is probably false. So, at this point, he was probably lying. It's, it's that simple. He insisted all was well between him and Lacey. Tell me about the state of your marriage. Hmm. What, what kind of marriage was it? God, I mean, the first word that comes to mind is you know, glorious and we took care of each other. That's a question for me, just thinking about the whole scenario itself. He's cheating on his wife. I don't think that if he's cheating on his wife, the relationship is glorious. But he does something that is very common in actual genuine recollection, and that's that squint of the eyes. You can see it just lightly as he's looking down into the side. He's squinting and he's recollecting. That's a genuine expression of recollection. This has been largely proven by some researchers at the University of Rochester as they've been trying to gather expressions of people who are lying or who are experiencing various emotions and feeding it to AI so that the AI can find patterns. They're not giving any extra information to the AI, it's simply a pattern finding AI system. And oddly enough, this expression of squinting of the eyes, regardless of where you're looking. We're not buying into the directional eye cues. We're simply talking about the expression of the eyelids themselves. When it's squinting, it seems to be on average that people are recollecting genuinely during those times. So that's odd, in my opinion, that he's doing that expression of possible genuine recollection, and then he produces this word of glorious? It doesn't seem plausible to me. Something seems off. We have to keep watching. Maybe that will unveil itself throughout the rest of the interview. Very well. Um, she was amazing. She is amazing. When Scott Peterson's parents and other family members yeah. does a few eyebrow raises and he has a small partial smile in there as well. So far I'm finding a weird mixture between this deceitful side of things from Scott and this genuine side of things from Scott. It's pretty muddy right now. I have to keep watching. Join the interview. They said their faith in his innocence never wavered, even though they were surprised about the affair. Susan, your, what's your, what was your reaction when you heard? I was very shocked, to be quite honest. Um, it's not in Scott's character. And when you hear people now out in the country say, did he do it? What do you want to say to them? This is odd. This isn't Scott. This is his mom. But when Diane says there's people asking, did he do it? and his mom starts nodding yes, is this in saying yes, they are asking that, or is she suspicious of her son? It's an important question, and doesn't really look good for the face of Scott on this, just even if your mom might possibly believe that you did it, that's pretty awkward for Scott. But I saw that, wanted to make note of that, just because it seems odd non-verbally in that place. He couldn't have if... if possible. It's impossible, if he knew Scott, he. He's the gentlest soul I think I've ever, 
I've ever known. That wasn't true from the dad. The entire time he's shaking his head. At first it was aligned with the it's impossible. Impossible, shaking head no makes sense. But then he continues on and he says, Scott's the gentlest soul that he has ever known. But he also throws a I think in there and it just really undermines the entire statement, which that means that his dad didn't fully buy what his dad was saying. His dad didn't believe himself on that, so why would we bother believing him on that? That means that there's more to Scott than what his dad is saying, which means that there could be that side of Scott that is this dark monster the courts kind of found him to be. The police interviewed Scott Peterson three times, but after he got a lawyer, he did not talk to them again. His house was searched twice, and more questions about his behavior began to surface. A neighbor says that the first thing that Lacey did every morning was pull open the curtains. Mm. But this morning, they were never pulled open. Yeah, they were down when I returned. Um, it's very common in the summer that she opens up the curtains. Speaking on the question in itself, this has nothing to do with anything. Sure, there are definitely people that have routines. For instance, me and my wife, every single morning, I wake up and I make coffee and I open the curtains. That's every single morning. I can actually personally recount a couple times in the past several months that I didn't do that. And believe it or not, nobody was murdered that day. Uh, it just didn't happen. Sometimes oddities happen in routines. It's not that big a deal. Absolutely not that big a deal. Didn't even think about it. And then by the time I thought about it, didn't feel like doing it, and my wife didn't care enough, so it just didn't happen. That doesn't mean anything sinister. And his response to it is adequate. There's nothing that seems to be deceitful around that. Once again, there's a lot of the eye blocking that I've just seen again and again and again, and it's extremely odd to me how much there is. But in its quantity, that could indicate that it's just a part of his baseline, is this prolonged eye blocking. But again, you know, we're talking about a day that, I don't know what it was, probably 40 degrees that day or something. Little flash of a contempt mouth shrug there. So a mouth shrug is just, I don't know, that's quite literally what a mouth shrug is. It's a nonverbal statement of uncertainty. So that makes sense. But the contempt in there as well, perhaps it is towards the ridiculousness of the question itself. Is it really worth anybody's time to note that the curtains weren't open? He could see it as not, so that would be where that contempt slips in. So it's an odd flash of, a, of an expression, and those are the emotions that are usually tied to it. It's just a matter of finding what the reason for those emotions are. And during the winter, we don't open the curtains to keep the house warm. Nothing to that. Nothing suspicious. No, I mean, um, certainly I wish they, if, if something had happened to her in the house, I wish they'd been open to someone. This is odd. This is just odd non-verbally. And Scott does just have a lot of odd non-verbal patterns. But he says that, no, there's nothing odd about it. And he does another mouth shrug. This is also mirroring the, I don't know, I don't think so. But then he does a really heavy eye block. And then he opens his eyes really wide and intensely. And it's like, okay, just take a chill for a second. This is odd. This is a spike in his non-verbal communication. This kind of intensity doesn't show up anywhere. Makes me ask why. Why does this intensity show up now where it hasn't shown up anywhere else? And it could be an overcompensation. It could be something to where he was like, no, I wish that somebody, you know, I hope they were open. Just please don't suspect me of this because see, I'm hoping really intensely that the windows were open so that people could see. It almost feels like that overcompensation. Regardless, it's something that I've made note of and I can keep track of as I continue the rest of the read. Maybe they'll stop it, but in the winter, you know, who opens their curtains for the draft? Another little partial shrug there, looking down. It's still reaffirming the words that he's saying. He's saying that he doesn't know why would somebody do this, and his body language is also saying he doesn't know as well. This is a good example of synchronized body language. Another story that is out there is that the kitchen was spotless. Mm hmm and in fact, there was still a wet mop around, which indicated somebody had cleaned something very yeah, recently. Lacey was mopping the floors when I left that morning. Um, yes, the house is spotless. She had a cleaning lady on uh, Monday. So during that time, once again, his heavy eye blocking pops up. 
I know that I keep bringing this up and it's just so prevalent that it's almost making it to where it's irrelevant, it's unreliable because of all of the odd points that it's popping up, either one, all of these points mean something because of the eye block or the eye block doesn't mean as much because it's on all of these points. And since it's been on points that are trivial and points that are pretty important, I feel like it's becoming more and more of a baseline pattern rather than an oddity, be it a positive spike from said baseline. The 23rd. So if, if the cleaning lady had been there, why have, why have to clean again? Dog, two cats, muddy backyard. She mopped those floors every day. So this one, you could see a little bit of a smile of contempt come into his face here. And when you see somebody who expresses contempt like this, that is a feeling of moral or psychological superiority over the other person. So during this answer, he has such a good answer that he knows it. He feels that he knows that he had a great, solid answer for that, which it is. If you haven't owned pets and have a backyard that can get muddy, the kitchen can be very, very dirty, and that can bother a lot of people, which would make sense if he's saying that she cleans the floors basically every day. That's really not out of the ordinary if they have pets like that. And he kind of knew that his answer was a pretty strong answer in regards to that, and it shows up on his face in this smile of contempt. Then I emptied the bucket when I returned that afternoon. There was one report that a neighbor had seen you loading something into a vehicle? I haven't seen that report. Did you load anything into a vehicle? Or anything large? Some umbrellas. Some market umbrellas. Those are those um, you know, the umbrellas on the stands that are you know, eight feet in diameter or something like that. The quick answer again, no contempt during this time. But Diane is doing a very intentional interview method where she asks a question and then she just sits quietly. And she'll sit quietly until Scott fills that blank dead space with words, hopefully information, more telling information. This is a sign of just a trained interrogator or interviewer and it's showing up here pretty prevalently. But Scott doesn't offer any needless details during this. He simply offers the information that you would need to know to clarify. And that's good. If he had been adding just way too many frivolous details, like perhaps the color of the, the umbrellas or how they were wrapped up or how hard it was to get them into the truck or things like that, those are needless details that Diane frankly doesn't need to know. But instead, he just says what kind and size of umbrellas he was loading into the truck that morning. And this is a sign of authenticity. It's not a guarantee that he's being authentic, but it is pushing towards that direction. When did you do that? That morning. If all these actions seem suspicious, they're still circumstantial. I want to go back to a couple of other questions people have. I've heard so many people say, Christmas Eve, mm. you have a very pregnant wife, and you decide to go fishing? Mm -hmm. What does that say about the two of you? Well, um, we had plans that evening with mom, Lacey's mom, over at her house. Um, frankly, uh, Christmas preparations were, were done. Another burst of odd nonverbal energy at this point, and that pushes me towards, once again, the direction of possible deceit. The other places that this has shown up has indicated deceit. And we also know that from earlier on in the interview, we've kind of established that maybe that relationship wasn't as strong and as healthy as he's trying to say it is. So there could be that aspect of that dynamic on this day. Maybe they're not doing super well, and he's like, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna go fishing because he's not getting along well with his wife, that could explain that oddity as well. What did you get her for Christmas? Oh, a Louis Vuitton wallet. Um, but so many lip compressions here. Does he regret this? That's what it's pushing me to believe, is that he regrets maybe spending that money on a Louis Vuitton wallet, those lip compressions right after that, that's a sign of regret. In this specific instance, it would be seen as a sign of regret. 
He's biting back the negative emotions centered around that. It makes sense for it to be a feeling of regret around that specific purchase. Preparations were made. Um, her plan for the day was to prepare gingerbread cookies. Um, my day was open to um, either play golf or go fishing. I chose fishing that day, which is, you know, uh, choice I made and I obviously regret now, you know, if I could. So he actually brings this up in his initial interrogation footage as well, that he had the choice between going golf and going fishing. And because of the weather, he felt that it was too cold to go golfing. So he went fishing. So that's continuity between stories there. That's good indication for a lack of deceit, but that doesn't clear him totally on this. Just decided to stay home. That's what would have happened. I noticed during the interview he had not yet talked about something. You haven't mentioned your son. Hmm. That was, it's so hard. That part I don't buy as much. It's like he feels that he should slide into a sad emotion there, and then he slides into a sad emotion. Before that, it's just pretty blank, pretty neutral in his face and then it shifts into it. Not that it feels like it's coming up from within, it just feels more like it's a shift. And that would lead me to believe, and this is far from concrete, it just leads me to believe that maybe he wasn't as interested in having a kid as his wife was. He could still be sad, but it would explain why the son wasn't that prevalent in his mind during this interview. Their baby boy was due on February 16th. Tell me about the nursery. Can't go in there. The door is closed until there's someone to put in there. But it's ready. So during this time, it does seem as though he is showing genuine grief. He's doing lip compressions. He's closing his eyes, things that you would normally see in a classic cluster of sadness or grief. He does this smile again, which he did prior, where it feels like he might be smiling through the pain. And that's what led me to believe it the first time, is that there is a little bit of oddity between his smile and his eyes. So I feel like that might be a response of Scott's is to try to smile during uncomfortable situations. Throughout the interview, he insisted he was innocent. Are you afraid police will arrest you? No. I know there's, there's no basis and I had nothing to do with their disappearance. So there, there's no, uh, no possible evidence or anything like that. Have they given you reason to think they, that you're their prime suspect? Um, yeah, I mean, with, you know, hold, you know, with the, the search warrants for the cars and things like that, certainly. Um, with the, you know, a search warrant for the home, um, when it gets specific to a car, obviously they're, they're looking at, you know, me. Okay, that wraps up this video. Let's do a little bit of a summary of just what I was able to gather from this entire thing. Non-verbally speaking, Scott has some over-the-top oddities. He has some non-verbal patterns that strike me as different or strange, and that is taking into consideration all of the research that I did outside of this little blip that you got to see here. He does have odd non-verbal patterns. While this is the third video that I have done on Scott Peterson, I was able to prepare for this one far better than I was the other two. I was able to take time to be able to pour over hours more footage and to read through all of the court documents that were available to the public as well. And this helped inform me even further as to the aspects of this case that were more unknown to me earlier on. To catch everybody up to speed as to who Scott Peterson is and what he did and why he is where he is now, Let's go ahead and dive into yet a little bit better of a backstory. So Scott Peterson, who was in his late 20s, was married to Lacey Peterson, who was in her mid-20s, and they were set to have a son named Connor. 
Lacey was eight months pregnant at the time of all of the incidents that will be unfolding here soon. Now, a little bit about Scott growing up. He was apparently, according to his family, very, very kind, and to quote his father, almost unbelievably kind. Which I find suspicious because I have yet to meet a child who is completely and unbelievably kind. That being said, that is something that I was taking into consideration with this read. Along with that, people say that he was a very controlled and composed person at most times, easy to get along with, and rarely confrontational. Lacey was a very outgoing, bubbly, happy personality, also very confident in who she was as a person. Both of them seemed to be an excellent couple. They got married, tried to have a child for three years, and then finally received a positive pregnancy test back. Fast forward eight months, and we start seeing a little bit of unhappiness unfold. First, Scott is having an affair. He is seeing a girl named Amber Fry, who is young in and of herself, and has a child who is less than two years old. He, however, does not tell Amber that he is married, and he does not tell Lacey that he is seeing Amber until a friend finds out and gives him an ultimatum. Then he decides that he has to go and tell Lacey. According to his interviews, he says that Lacey took it rather well, which I found suspicious, and his body language also said was suspicious, but he did not tell Amber. Later on, Amber found out and went forward quite promptly during this entire explosion of media coverage of Lacey's disappearance. She went forward and said that she had been his girlfriend and had been under the impression that he had no other women in his life. This would seem abnormal if it weren't for the fact that he had done this before outside of his marriage with Lacey, with other girls as well, who have also come forward on record. So he has a repeat history of having affairs or cheating on the women that he was with. So needless to say, he tells Lacey that he's having an affair and things start to go fairly far south. In that time, he also buys a boat secretly. He also starts researching at that same time on Google how certain currents and water flows occur in the San Francisco Bay area, and he says that it is in regards to fishing. Speaking of fishing, he also has a history of searching for sturgeon primarily and a few other types of fish. So he chalked all of his search history up and the purchasing of a boat for wanting to go fishing. This comes in play later on. Let's fast forward to the 24th. Remember, Scott has told Lacey that he's having an affair, and he says that Lacey's pretty okay with it. Upset, but pretty okay with it. I didn't buy that, and I still don't buy that. The 24th, Christmas Eve, is supposed to be both busy in the evening, relaxed in the first half of the day, according to Scott. So he said that Christmas Eve evening, they were supposed to go and celebrate with Lacey's family. And the day before that was spent on preparation. However, he also claimed that most of the preparation had already taken place. So he had the morning section free. And he says they get up at a certain time. They watch a show, a specific show. And then he heads out anywhere between 9.30 and 10.30 to go fishing. What's interesting about this is that he had told a neighbor that he had gone golfing. Needlessly lied about it. Nobody's sure why. I believe it is a pattern. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So he says that he goes fishing, leaving his eight-month pregnant wife at home by herself to more or less prep for the evening herself and have some quiet time. Well, it is said that Lacey was supposed to go walking the dog during this time. And while Scott is fishing, something apparently happens. According to Scott, he had tried to call Lacey multiple times while out fishing and received no response. And when he got home, he found not only was the car there, the keys were there, and her normal belongings were in the house. To make things more strange, the back door was unlocked, and the dog was in the backyard with the leash still on. It's very curious. So instead of calling friends and family, he decides that he needs to wash his clothes that he, and I quote, said were dirty from fishing, to eat some pizza, and to relax for a bit before calling Lacey's mom and says that right off the bat, she is missing. 
He doesn't check where she's at. He doesn't ask if the mom has heard from Lacey. He simply jumps to the conclusion that she is missing. She is not in the house, ergo, she is missing. Now, needless to say, the parents are a little bit more concerned about this than Scott seems to be, so they are the ones who call 911 and alert the police. All during this time, Scott has a cool, casual, unbothered demeanor. As the neighborhood and police explode into an activity of trying to track down Lacey, Scott maintains this detached, uninterested, unconcerned demeanor, and it starts to alert people. People start finding it as strange, understandably so. So he is asked in that very night, the night of the 24th of December, to go into the police quarters to be able to have a further interview to clarify things and maybe remember things you didn't before. Today, I'm going to be analyzing part of that footage, the footage of the initial interrogation that was held on Scott Peterson the night that his wife and unborn son reportedly went missing. We're going to be talking about the nonverbal aspects of it, and then I will also continue talking about the case as things continue. This was a very, very interesting case and extremely frustrating on many, many levels, and you'll get to see why. So I am going to talk real quick here as the investigator and interrogator is coming into the room. I'm going to talk a little bit about Scott's body language that he's presenting here and some of the limitations of this footage and what I am trying to carry out today. First, his body language seems pretty relaxed. He doesn't seem fidgety. He doesn't seem antsy. He's simply looking through some documents or pictures here on the table. Along with that, he's leaning forward, his hands are out of his pockets, and all of this is just indicating that he's relaxed and involved in what is going on. Now, speaking on the footage itself, as you can see, as per always, the quality is next to nothing. It's extremely difficult to see any details, let alone the minute movements of the face that I would like to be able to see. So today's read is going to be specifically centered around looking at the entire case and then also trying to pay attention as best as possible to Scott's entire body movements, his broad gestures, his posturing, his tone, things that we can hear and see clearly enough. However, it is still very, very limited. And this was one of the frustrations right off the bat, is that I cannot see his face very clearly. You can sometimes see general broad expressions, but as far as any micro or mini expressions, it is absolutely impossible to see. Let's keep watching. Pretty much got all I'm going to do. Let's just go over what, what we already talked about so I can make some notes. See if you remember something that you don't, maybe you don't know you remember. So right off the bat, something that I am noting is the distancing and blocking that Scott is immediately doing. Now this can be chalked up to that's how he most comfortably sits. Many people can relate to the sitting back, crossing the legs as a comfortable position, especially if you're in for something for a long haul, be it a movie, or in this case, an interrogation. But he does immediately set back into that when the investigator comes in. This is an odd point to do that, not only because he could have been doing that before while looking through the documents or pictures that he had, but also because it's at the instance that the person who could be threatening his innocence or his story comes into the room. So this is something that I immediately made note of in Scott's behavior. Now speaking on Scott's baseline, I feel like I have a very accurate idea of what Scott's baseline is and one of his tells of stress that repeatedly pops up throughout all of the footage is an increase in pitch and an increase in the fragility of his tone. He gets that froggy, croaky, fried sound to his voice. And then you will see that come up multiple times throughout this story. But all in all, already, I'm not a huge fan of this, but there's nothing that really sets me off in any direction or another. 
So, today, tell me about the morning. Um, okay. <sighs> I don't know what time I got up. Probably, uh, Lacey got up and went and, um, soon had, and she had some chill for breakfast. Mm-hmm. He's right, she wakes up, otherwise she gets sick. So you can hear the timbre, the tone of his voice. It's fairly projected. It's fairly casual. There's not a lot of strain. Now, in normal circumstances, this could be seen as pretty okay. And that's how I went into the previous interrogations. However, after considering the broader picture of things, I find this odd. Not only because it's very out of place for the intensity of the situation, you can't see the clock here, but it is just at midnight, so he would be tired and he would likely be stressed after a long day of not knowing where his pregnant wife is, which he said himself he had a glorious relationship with. That does not line up with his behavior. Now, here's an issue that I found in this case largely, is that there is no concrete evidence either direction. There's no concrete evidence for his innocence, and unfortunately, there's no concrete evidence for his guilt. There is a massive boatload of circumstantial evidence for his guilt, and then there are some pretty scrambling facts for his innocence. So this was something that I had to churn through quite regularly in my studies during this, is trying to figure out what was evidence, what wasn't evidence, what was admissible, and what wasn't admissible. And I can assure you, you don't need to go and read through the hundreds of pages of court documents because you will be bored out of your mind. Needless to say, right off the bat, I want to make something very clear. There was no concrete evidence of his guilt. It was all circumstantial. But the defenses, his side, Scott's side, their only goal was not to prove his innocence, but just to make it to where he was not seen as guilty beyond reasonable doubt. That was their only goal. And right off the bat for me, that's a red flag. If it's not to prove your innocence, and it's just to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he could be guilty, that is usually a sign of guilt. But let's continue watching his body language. Uh, I laid around the bed longer and I got up at uh, 8 o'clock probably or so. Uh, showered. And, um, we were watching her favorite show, Martha Stewart. Watched a little bit of that. This is an interesting detail. If you're recounting your day and you're telling somebody that you were doing your morning routine, you say you got up, you showered, blah, 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 then do you say that you watched a specific show or do you just say, yeah, we watched some TV, we did dot, dot, dot. This is an interesting verbal detail that he adds into the story. It's very specific. We watched her favorite show, Martha Stewart. My question is, why would he admit that? Why would he present that so clearly and so upfront unless he needed it to be there. This is important, and I'll talk more about it as things go on, but I really want to try to focus on what we can from his body language and then consider the rest of the evidence in combination with that. You didn't watch the whole thing, though? No. Remember what part you saw? I mean, I don't know what hit him. The cookie deal. I don't know. Cookies of some sort. They're talking about what to do with meringue. This is an important detail. And I don't think that he's lying here. In fact, I know that he's not lying here because sure enough, they went and they researched what was on TV that day. Martha Stewart was on TV that day. And according to Scott, it was Lacey's favorite show. Now, the defense claimed why on earth would that be on if Lacey wasn't alive? Say perhaps Scott had already done the deed and Lacey wasn't alive, why would that show be on and why would he know? Well, it's interesting. If he were used to perhaps covering his tracks as somebody who has been shown to be not only a pathological liar, but also a serial adulterer would be used to, he would know that he would have to have some form of evidence for him having watched that show. So if he turned that show on intentionally, one, if it was Lacey's favorite show, he would know when it would come on. It comes on regularly 
scheduled. So if it came on at its regular time, he could turn it on, pick up a few details, and then that would more or less seal his alibi that he had been watching that show with Lacey. It would be a very easy, simplistic setup to imply his innocence in a situation. And I feel like this is the case in this. He specifically mentions Martha Stewart because he intentionally placed that detail into his story. Let's keep watching. And I, I can't remember. Your house, you had the, the converted garage area as a TV room light? Yeah. Is that where you were then? Okay, did you eat any breakfast? Yeah, I was here. Okay, and then... Uh, Something else that I want to note, remember how I mentioned that one of his tells is his tone. And what I want to note is that all of this so far has been fairly evident. It hasn't had any of those tells that he normally portrays where it becomes more fragile or it raises or he talks more softly. It's all being pretty much consistent. So during this point of the interrogation, I don't necessarily believe that he's telling a lie. If he is telling a lie, he's mixing it with enough truth that it makes it difficult to detect, especially somebody in my position just trying to rely on a horrible video with horrible audio to see if there's any deception. But that is something that's important to note is that during this part, he's not showing his regular tell. Let's keep watching to see if it shows up. Um, when did you realize you were going to go fishing? Well, oh, that was a morning decision. It's either, oh, it was a morning so it's like off at the club or Real quick on his storyline, he maintains the storyline of he was making a decision that morning, whether he was going to go golfing or whether he was going to go fishing. However, he told multiple different people, multiple different stories, which was one of the indicators that I picked up on in him being a pathological liar. Pathological liars will oftentimes needlessly lie about needless information. There's no reason for him to lie about it, but he does. And this pops up often throughout his life from what I was able to gather from my research. Um, she's going to finish cleaning up, like I said, she's going to the kitchen floor. Um, take the dog for a walk, and then she's going to the store to buy for the Christmas morning breakfast tour. And that was going to be a involved prep. So that was her afternoon, just prepping for breakfast, and she's going to make gingerbread cookies for so. herself. So you can hear just lightly a little bit of that pitch change in his tone. Just a little bit. It's very, very soft and it's very, very minute. But it is important to note that it's starting to happen when he's re recollecting what she was going to do. And the reason for that could be, quite literally, that he knew she was never going to do said things. This isn't guaranteed. This is all still just surmising based off of what I have seen before. Entry of the front door or the entry of your little window? Uh, when I, oh, the, um, no, not the front door, but that back door that we came in. Right, where the mop was outside of it? No. Uh, oh, oh, where you, oh, where your dogs weren't out to your well, backyard? Okay, we have the converted garage, yeah. right? Then you have the kitchen, yeah. then you have a room with two chairs in it. Right. And, uh, yeah, that room. Yeah. And the kitchen. So take note real quick of a few things that's happening with Scott non-verbally. First, his projection and his confidence in his words has spiked back up. He's also using illustrators with his hands. This means that he's more comfortable using illustrators with his hands. And to back that up, it shows up regularly throughout the rest of his interviews. Here, however, he keeps his hands mostly securely crammed into his pockets. This is not a good non-verbal display of openness. Immediately, this will unsettle anybody, even if they don't quite realize why they're unsettled. So this interrogator absolutely felt that, and he's gone on record saying that he felt that Scott was 
off. He wasn't sure why. This is part of the reason why, because you can see that Scott comfortably illustrates with his hands. However, throughout the rest of the interview, they're very, very much crammed into his pockets. And so when he's talking about something that's not incriminating, that has nothing to incriminate him with, he's just talking about where his wife would mop. And he's talking about the spaces, he's pointing on the table for a map layout, so he's talking visually, and he's saying so confidently without any ums, stutters, or any pitch changes. These are all important aspects of Scott's nonverbal communication that I was able to pick up on during all of my study. So right now, this all seems pretty okay, right? He seems to be very conversational. He's just having a chat. And this would seem okay, except for the conditions that things are occurring in. And we'll get to my feelings on this a little bit more later on in the video. But one of the prosecution's biggest arguments is that Scott seemed off the whole time. They just said that he seemed off. And some psychologists argue that that isn't really a standard. There's not a standard for how you handle trauma, and that's very true. There's not a standard for how you handle trauma. Everybody handles difficult situations like that massively differently. That being said, there are regulations for how microexpressions and body language display themselves in various instances. And in these instances, the body language that Scott is portraying is nothing if not abnormal. He's showing no agitation. He's showing no interest even with what's going on. Everything is completely detached. Now, without being able to see the smaller details of his face, it's going to be hard to be able to decipher whether this is dissociation or something along those lines, or if he's just emotionally detached. If we're considering his history according to family and friends, he is usually composed. That being said, this isn't a usual instance. Most people will have some form of visible negative reaction towards trauma in their lives at some point. At some point throughout years, they will have visible reactions to trauma. And Scott, over 17 years, has never shown an interest in his wife's disappearance emotionally or non-verbally. I can say that with certainty, having combed through every single minute of available footage that I was able to track down from multiple news sources and multiple platforms. He never shows concern for the disappearance of his wife and unborn son. This is an oddity. It is absolutely an oddity. Let's keep watching. How did it, did you move it back after or when you come home or how did it get outside? Yeah. So you put it out there? Mm -hmm. So when you left, do you remember what she was wearing? Uh, black pants, uh, white long sleeve top. The kind of buttons or no, it's like a long sleeve t-shirt. This is an interesting section here. You see, Lacey's remains were later discovered, obviously, as were Connor's, along the Bay Area. But Lacey was not wearing the clothes that Scott claimed she was wearing at the time. Also, during this time, while he's recollecting, his pitch does again change, as does his tone. It grows softer. If you listen to the segment where he's recollecting where she mops, as opposed to what she's wearing, you can hear the absolute, obvious pitch change. This is a red flag to me as a nonverbal analyst as I try to take into consideration all of his nonverbals. That includes his body language, but also includes his pitch and his tone. This is all vitally important for the case, and it's odd that it starts popping up here.
jacket or no? shoes? No. No shoes? Interesting place to take a drink as well. When you lie, oftentimes you can get nervous and your mouth can dry out. Now a pathological liar will be able to control some aspects of their body language. There are some things that are so automatic that we cannot control it. There are some muscle movements and there are some interior body movements that we cannot control regardless of how much we lie. One of those things can be a dry mouth. This doesn't affect everybody and I'm not saying that's happening here. I am however saying that it is absolutely strange that it pops up after his normal tell of a tone slash pitch change and then he already has been verified to be lying about what Lacey was wearing at least when he saw her last. So this is odd. This is where more and more lies seem to be woven into his recollection. Do you notice her jacket? Her jacket was there? Or did she wear it? Like if she went walk, walking at 10 o'clock or 9.30, she just steals my stuff. She uses your stuff? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. doesn't return to stuff, so I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. At her or mine? How about shoes? Does she have a certain kind of shoes that she walks in? Or yeah, I use a pair of white tennis shoes. You know, do you remember if they were there or not? Um, the officer and I looked for them in their normal place, which is outside of our wet bar. Uh -huh. um, I apologize for the audio quality. I'm having trouble hearing it myself. I did my best to clean this audio up so that you could hear it. The original footage was not only very, very quiet, but it also had a very massively overwhelming electronic feedback and hiss over the top of everything. So what you're hearing is heavily treated audio and it's still just hot, nasty garbage in area. So I apologize for that. But you can hear as he's talking about what his wife would normally wear, his projection comes back up, his confidence comes back up, and he doesn't have any of this uncertain tone to his words that he does in other areas. So in this part, it's obviously not a lie. He is certain that his wife usually wore her white tennis shoes, as she always did. That's not a lie. That's a truth. And part of what makes a convincing lie is being able to interweave your lies with a lot of truth. It's far easier to disguise a lie with a boatload of truths than it is to try to fabricate an entire lie. And that's what I think Scott was able to do during this entire storyline, is he wove truths around his lie. But we'll talk about more why I feel that in a bit. They were not there, but we didn't look further so they could be in the house. They weren't where they normally left. You saw mine where those were. That's where they normally left. Okay, so then about 9.30 you left. Mm -hmm. And you drove your four-door truck. Um, and you went over to your shop. Right. What did you do over there? Um, I assembled my uh, Mortiser. You know, mortiser is yeah. it's a woodworking tool. Yeah. Make tables. Yeah. Uh, you maybe saw it on the uh, trailer there. Once again, he has a little bit of a softer tone here when he's saying that he assembled his mortiser. It's a woodworking tool that he did purchase and there are records of him purchasing it. And he also seemed to have put it together at some point before police ever had access to that storage room. However, I do find it odd that his tonal change is in there as well. But now he's about to start explaining what it is and he starts using his hands again and he regains his confidence and everything builds back up when he's talking about something that isn't centered around his wife and unborn son. Before that, I also want to mention that I did do the research for this. I wanted to see if maybe there was a period of time that wasn't accounted for in Scott's recollection of the day. And if he is lying about this, if he did the crime himself and he has concocted this alibi, he did a really good job at it. A really good job at it because every single thing that he's saying lines up time-wise and he has evidence for most sections. There are a few sections that he does not have evidence for. One, he doesn't have any evidence that Lacey and him were actually in the house 
as casual as watching TV early on because nobody was there. We just have to take his word for it. Along with that, we have no evidence that he did not load a body into his truck, unload it into a boat, and go from there. The only thing that the defense had in that is that he would have had to do that on broad daylight. And who would have done that? Well, to be very frank, with the setup of his shop that he's gone to here, his storage area, his warehouse, whatever you want to call it, it has a roll up door that you can back up to to be able to hook up a boat into, a trailer, so on and so forth. So the distance that he would have had to move a body to get into, say, a boat would be minimal, very, very minimal. I'm saying maybe five to six feet to get it from cover to cover. So from the truck bed to the actual warehouse itself and into the boat. That's not a lot of distance, and that's very, very easy to move stuff that amount of distance without taking any notice, especially if you're moving things into a shop that you regularly do manual labor with, nobody's gonna bat an eye. But I just wanted to say that so far, timing-wise, his alibi completely checks out, and that's impressive. Uh, yeah, big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just got that, so I assembled it. Check my email. Send one email. Put the boat up and went. Who did you send the email to? To uh, Eric Van Enis, my boss. The happy holiday email. He left me a message on my phone this morning. Okay, so you assembled. This, uh, what the thing, what was the thing you assembled called? Called a mortiser. For mortise and tendon joints. Where'd you get that? Ordered it online. On uh, eBay auction, actually. Is that for home or for work? It's for home. Not home. That's woodwork. Yeah. You do a little bit of that? Okay, the facts you got, you hadn't got it yet. Or did yeah, you? I guess not. I, I'm, I don't know. You can't play. And there he has a little bit of uncertainty in his storyline with the, yeah, I guess not. However, I want to just talk about a frustration I'm having with his body language because it's, a, it's extremely frustrating for me, is that I'm just seeing nothing. It's like reading a blank book. You turn every page, you look as close as you can, and it's blank. Scott is a blank book, and he shouldn't be. In this instance, of all instances, he should not be. He should be giving some signs of care for his wife. The only thing that he's displaying and had always displayed and will always display is a lack of care for Lacey. Because in Scott's mind, it's all about him until he doesn't like it. And he did this on repeat before with other women. He never killed them, but there was never a pregnancy involved. And he did this again and again and again and again. And since he is known to be a pathological liar, he is comfortable with lying. It's extremely frustrating to watch somebody give so few cares about the person he said he had a glorious relationship with. Even if he doesn't emote that way. Because let's just, let's play devil's advocate here for a second. Say he doesn't emote that way. Perhaps he's not a very cryy person. Perhaps he's not a very fidgety person. Perhaps he's very, very controlled under pressure and only shows sadness when nobody sees. One, don't buy it. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Nobody's that controlled over this long of time. He's never broken, ever. He's never visibly broken. And the times that he broke came across as very forced. That makes me uncomfortable non-verbally as well. But say he does maintain composure regularly. He's not a, an emotive person. He doesn't even act like he's interested in trying to track down his wife. Even remotely, even in some of the footage that I was able to track down from the earlier interviews that wasn't usable for this video, even from that footage, there is instances of his phone ringing while a search is occurring for his wife and he doesn't even think to go look at it. He asks if they want him to shut it off. If I were in his shoes, I would be very concerned. If my wife was missing, especially if she was pregnant, eight months pregnant, if she was missing and my phone rang, I would immediately drop everything else. I don't give a flying rat's ass about the interview. I would care about her. He has other priorities. He only cares 
for himself. This is made prevalent, and this is the storyline that I found the most convincing. But let's keep watching his nonverbal communication. Uh, I remember that, that the boat was right in 26, and I wasn't happy about that, but other than that, it may have been when I got back from the office. Okay, then you hooked your boat up, and uh, you know about what time you left Modesto. Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, I, you know, extrapolate what time I got that deal at noon, is that right? Yeah, that was uh, no one. And which one is it there? You know, it has two times. Oh, okay. Um, which one's right? Tuesday. Time twelve fifty four on December twenty first. Five months expires. Okay. Expires. So for those of you who are hearing, having trouble hearing it, they're talking about what time he left his shop as opposed to what time he got to the bay itself. So he's saying that he doesn't remember when exactly he left his shop. So what they're doing is they're looking at a ticket stub that he got at the bay area and trying to more or less kind of reverse engineer it to determine when he might have left the shop. This is understandable. I will leave places and not have any idea what time I left a place just because it's not something that you always have to keep track of. So I understand that on Scott's side. And his math does line up. However, there is a possible gap of anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes that are inexplicable. Nobody saw him. Nobody knows what he was doing while at his shop. And it would be plenty of time to perhaps maybe move 150 pounds or so into a boat from the back of a truck. That's all that I'm saying. I'm not saying that is what happened. I'm saying it could have happened there. And nobody would be able to say otherwise besides Scott. Okay, so you got there at 1 o'clock. Okay, did you drive straight there? I did. You stop for lunch? No. By the bay? No, not the bay for sure. You didn't buy no lunch? You didn't eat nothing? You didn't take a lunch? No, I didn't. So I was damn hungry for that pizza when I got home. Okay, so if you got to the about five minutes to one, you get your boat in, how long do you think you stayed in the water? Okay, so now we're at the water, right? He's gotten into the water. It's past one o'clock. This is important detail. It's a very important detail, and I'll explain to you why actually right now. So Scott's alibi is that he was fishing by himself conveniently in the San Francisco Bay Area for sturgeon, as he later said. In this interrogation, he says that he doesn't know what he was fishing for, which is not a thing, by the way. If you're a fisherman, you know this, you go out with the intention of catching a specific fish. Be it one fish or a group of fish, you have an idea of what you're fishing for. You also kind of coordinate the bait that you would get to catch said fish. Well, he said he's searching for sturgeon, which for those of you who don't know, sturgeon can often get up to 100 pounds. Not only did Scott not pack the correct poles for that, he also had a boat that was far too small for that, and he had the incorrect bait for that. None of that lined up. This would be okay if perhaps he was a novice fisherman, like myself. I would have no idea. I would have no idea. One, I wouldn't choose to go and search for a sturgeon if I had never done it before by myself. I would definitely want to go with somebody else. But Scott was an avid fisherman. He had been fishing since he was seven years old would often go on fishing trips by himself with other people, would often be seen fishing, loved to talk about fishing with his family and friends. In this instance, suddenly he had one, no idea about sturgeon, and then two, he had no idea that this is a terrible time to go fishing. The afternoon, one in the afternoon, is not a good time to go fishing. And a whole group of fishermen kind of took a look at this evidence, and they decided 100% certainty that this man did not leave this shore with the intention of catching one of those fish. He was not equipped for it. It all kind of lines up to where perhaps Scott wasn't being a simple happy-go-lucky fisherman on the day of the 24th. There may have been something a lot more sinister happening. Uh, I'm not sure anything, but see if I was 
Do you have a map for that area or no? Would you just wing it? So you just when you got in your boat and you took off, did you go very far or? well, I mean like a while went north, um, found a like a little island kind of deal there. Mm-hmm. Um, island uh, had a bunch of trash on it. I remember a big sign that said no landing. It looked like some broken piers around it, and I just assumed it'd be a Decent, you know, shallow area. Did you troll? A little bit. All right, so once again, he starts talking again about certain aspects, and he starts illustrating again, and I believe he's telling the truth at this point. Not only do I believe it, but I know he's telling the truth. I know that he went out and saw these things because other people went and retraced what his steps could have been and saw the same things, a beach full of trash and the sign and the island and everything that he's recounting. I believe he actually saw. His nonverbal communication aligns with that. So that is part of the truth that seems to be woven in with these other lies that he's telling, and that's why it's sold so well as truthful to so many people is because it could be seen as such. I'm going to talk about some of the issues that the case had, that both sides, the defendant and the prosecution, both of them, had issues during this case, and I'll talk about those at the end. Let's keep watching this, and then we'll just we'll wrap everything up as per usual. I mean, a lot of a lot of the reason I went was just to get that boat in the water to see. You know, yeah. Okay, so you fish in ninety minutes, about then what? You go back to go back to the marina, <clears throat> get back in the boat. Yeah. You see anybody? You talk to anybody out there? Um, talked to a couple guys fishing and asked me you know, if you catch anything and uh, they didn't either. Um, that part seems to be true. If we're going off of the tonal tell that we can tell, he is projecting it, he's enunciating clearly, he has confidence behind his words, there's no fragility, there's no increased pitch, the tone is rich and confident. I do believe he's telling the truth in this area. Sure enough, also, after I did enough research, I was able to discover that indeed people had seen him after the fact, while he was trying to load his boat back up, he had some difficulties, they were all laughing, so on and so forth. And if you think about it, say I'm right. Say that the theory that I have right now, based off of his behavior and the evidence given, say I'm right, and he had just dumped his pregnant wife into the bay, and then he's acting like nothing happened with these fishermen. It really puts into perspective who Scott is as a person. The guys working, fixing, uh, main, main, maintenance guys got a good laugh from me trying to back down the trailer. Okay. Uh, so a couple mm-hmm. guys laughing and a couple guys talking about fishing. Um, then what? Greg, how did you get there? Um, so you highway, do you mean? Yeah. Um, what's it, what's the highway to, uh, Oakland? It's 580? Yeah. And they take 80? Maybe north, right? right. To go to like go to Sacramento or um, so you took five eighty eighty. No, okay. Yeah, and it's like the second exit. And I checked with all that on maps. The route that he's talking about makes sense with the times that he's delivered. It's true. The recollection that he's talking about here is true. That is the route that he took. That is the time that it took. But that's not the question. The question is, what were you perhaps carrying in your truck while you took that route? Come over the same way? Yeah. yeah. Stop for gas. Stop for gas and uh, just a little, little more. But which one's near the Alpha Mine? A little more. Okay. Um, which stop? Uh, I think it's a Chevron station. There is a bus uh, around there. Is that on the way home or the way there? Hey, you have the receipt still? Uh, I need a receipt. Okay, when when you got in the car, what did you call? You said I called Lacey uh, just as I was leaving the marina. Home town where it was. Uh, home in the mobile. Did you uh, when you left? Were you wearing what, what were you wearing when you left? Uh, blue jeans, blue t-shirt. And what were those shoes? Oh, 
Timberwolves. Which jacket? Is that um, one in your jacket in your truck? Well, I left the house. Oh. I didn't have a jacket on. Right. Um, but I was in the warehouse. Um, I had that green pullover on. It was in my truck you saw. Uh, when it started raining, I had a camo jacket on in the boat. And a tan hat. Okay, so then you uh, went back to the shop. You didn't hook the boat. Mm-hmm. What happened? What else did you do? Anything else? No. I looked it. I guess I saw that Max. Uh, Blake getting home, so. Straight home. Anybody else in the warehouse area? Uh, came up? Not this afternoon. There was a pill this morning. Okay, I'm going to stop the interview here for a couple reasons. One, not only because his body language seems to be completely blank throughout the rest of the interrogation, which once again I found to be very frustrating, but because this storyline is one of the biggest areas that I find the most contention with, the one that I have the most issue with. Now let's talk about a little bit about the court hearing itself and how many issues there were within that. For the prosecution, they tried to bring in sniffer dogs. However, the defense quickly pointed out that those specific sniffer dogs that were used were not fully qualified to use their findings as concrete admissible evidence. It could be taken into consideration, but only in light of the rest of the evidence. That was their goal, was not to present Scott as guilt-free, but as not beyond a reasonable doubt found guilty. So they just got it knocked down to where it wasn't concrete. Well then on the defense's side, one of their demonstrations that they did is they they said that Scott couldn't physically lift and throw 150-ish pounds out of that small of a boat. Now the courts pushed against that and there's more issues with that beyond what the prosecution brought up. First, the prosecution brought up that one, not the same boat. It was a different boat. Two, the person who was trying to do the demonstration was working for the defense. So obviously, they're going to push for it to fail. And three, where that person was standing in that boat would never have been where a person would to try to throw something like that. So what the prosecution suggested was that the entire test be run again. But instead of using a different boat, you use the same boat that Scott has. The boat that the defense used, that Scott used for the argument, had a much higher center of gravity. The way it was built, it was more prone to tip. So they suggested, well, why not just use the boat that Scott used? You still have it, why not use it? Along with that, instead of having somebody from the defense try to do the test, which is obviously going to be flawed, why not use somebody who's either impartial or on the side of the prosecution? Because then that would really show that a person could in fact throw 150 pounds out of the boat. Oddly enough, the defense never allowed for that to happen. What a shock. Seems curious to me. That would be a pretty big home run hit for the defense if it did work that way, and despite all of the best efforts, it still failed. That would be great for Scott, but they decided not to do that. Also, Scott himself in this interrogation, which it's not on the footage that I presented with you, but it is there, he says and agrees to do a polygraph test. So when he agrees to it here, he knows that if he says no, he can't really have a good reason for that. His goal should be, yes, I want to clear myself for this, but if he says no, then that really doesn't go forward with that. So he says sure here, and then later on, is like I think it was either the day of or the day before the polygraph, when everything was getting set up, he calls in and says, you know what, scratch that, we're not doing the polygraph, which is a huge suspicious move. Why on earth would you not? Now it is true that polygraphs indeed can come up with false positives. All that a polygraph is measuring is a person's stress around certain questions. It's not really measuring truth, it's measuring stress. So perhaps he was advised to not do that. Not only if he was innocent, that might be a bad idea, but if he was guilty, that would be a terrible idea because there's a lot of stress around that. And this battle went back and forth. Finally, the defense found out that the jurors were not fairly selected. They specifically selected jurors that were all okay with the death sentence and omitted those who weren't, and that is unfair selection of jurors. They can largely oppose it, but when it boils down to it, have to be okay with it, but they selected people that all only supported 
the death sentence. And that's not fair to the defendant. So here recently, actually earlier this year, due to the flaws in the jury selection, Scott's death sentence has been overruled. He's still facing life in prison, but his death sentence is no longer viable due to that flawed selection. So this wraps up everything for Scott. For me, I am all but certain that he is a murderer. I have no sympathy for the man. If only for the fact that he showed repeatedly through his body language, through his behavior, and through his actions thereafterwards, that he showed no care for his wife and unborn son. And I find that alone to be trash, so I don't have sympathy for him. But with everything else, all of the lies that he told, needless lies, showing that he's a pathological liar, showing that he has a history of being able to cover his own ass from people who might be searching into that side of things, showing all of this and considering the massive amount of circumstantial evidence that was piled against him, I think that he is indeed guilty. I think that the courts got it correct. But to be very, very fair and to play devil's advocate, there is not concrete evidence. And unfortunately, he could not be proven guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt, though that is how the jurors found him to be. So was he completely guilty? I cannot say. Nobody can say. Nobody can even tell how Lacey was killed. But the alternatives, the defense's alternatives, what Scott and his attorneys presented were so far reaching and so out there that it seemed more of a fantasy world than the one created by the prosecution. In Scott's defense, there was a break-in on his street, and one of the aspects that his attorney presented was that perhaps the people who were doing the break-in across the street were confronted by Lacey and then they panicked and took her and had to dispose of her because they accidentally did a kidnapping, which is plausible, but then it does all of this stuff to frame Scott as well, making it seem like he's the one and not them and they left no trace, but he did, so on and so forth. And that one seems unrealistic. Another one that was suggested is that maybe a homeless person just happened upon her out in the park doing her thing and took her to the bay, which is, needless to say, hours away. The homeless person took a body from a park near their house in Modesto and traveled, I think it's an hour and 45 minutes to the bay where they deposited her and sent her out and then she washed back up, so on and so forth. And actually, it's interesting, the prosecution tried to bring in a hydrologist who was able to kind of map where perhaps the body would have originated. And the defense quickly pointed out that that hydrologist was not fully qualified and it was also knocked down to having to be considered in with all the rest of the evidence, circumstantial. That's my opinion of it. I'm sorry that this didn't have as much body language. To be very frank, there's not much body language in this interrogation. There's never much body language with Scott Peterson. And that's frustrating as a nonverbal analyst, but it keeps giving me a goal to reach for. I hope you enjoyed this video. I know this is part three, and I know that this was a very long video, but this is my wrapping up of the case of Scott Peterson. Let me know how you felt in the comments below. If you disagree with me, that's totally okay. Since there's not concrete evidence, it's really gonna still be up to opinion. I've given you my reasons. I've given you my reasons.